I'm not stood here today because of um, any kind of sort of AI technical prowess. It's basically because of the, the passion that I have for not only deep learning, but AI itself. And it's, um, so I'm talking to you about its impact on modern life, on humanity 2.0, shall we say. And, and this, is, um, this is something that we should be reminding ourselves that we've actually made, man-made, woman-made. Um, we are pretty much responsible for, for all this. And um, I'm also a bit of an amateur astrophysicist as well, so I kind of take um, a universal overview of... Um, of this thing and, and can really look at the, at the big picture. I'm also going old school with notes here just to try and make sure that I, uh, I actually keep within the lines. So this guy's a bit of a hero of mine, but we do share one thing in common and that's that we both hate maths. Um, I can do it, but it's, um, it's not my intuitive happy place. Um, I much prefer seeing formulas in, um, in code but the thing with AI is that we now already have AI for AI. Um, wet lab, for example, can already help you find the best parameters for, for deep learning. Um, we already have meta learning and generative programming. Um, I personally do a lot of work, not with NVIDIA, but um, in, in my second life with, um, with Wolfram. And this is natural language programming and, and there's some pretty stunning work coming out from there but I, um, I mentioned my second life and this it is the, the, the literal second life I actually paid um, real money to buy the Linden dollars that bought those boots and it's, it's all AI technology and um, visualisation that's actually running this and I'm actually stood there in, um, in my charity's virtual office in um, <clears throat> pardon me, in Second Life, which is um, what I use and, uh, and the, the medium of choice to actually do my, my other work, which is now extremely enabled by deep learning. This is Jackson. Um, he's a, a Maasai Ascari in um, a tiny place called Enkito, Kenya. And deep learning um, pretty much runs social media. Without deep learning, we wouldn't have all the billions of people connected. And it is Mark Zuckerberg uh, and it is Larry Page et al. Who, um, who are actually running with this altruism, proliferating deep learning backends for the billions of people who um, perhaps will never fully understand the actual concept, but hopefully will see the impact that it actually brings. Jackson recently graduated from primary school. Um, he doesn't have a whole lot of um, just options that, um, that, that we do. However, he can speak way better English than I can speak Ma, so there's, uh, there, there's ways of getting around these things. Um, I've actually used AI and, and obviously straight IT um, to run this, um, this volunteering network, um, and it's through that that I get to meet guys like, um, like Jackson. And, um, and it's important because you get to see other people's um, perspective around the globe and to experience life. So um, I did say earlier, I'm not here to, um, to sell NVIDIA, but um, there is one story I'd like to tell, and that was um, in, the, um, in the early 90s when the market basically thought that um, Jensen was just nuts. Um, no one, not a single person had a faintest idea why... Um, we could ever think that a glorified typewriter, which is basically what computers were back then, could have anything to do with gaming whatsoever. The, the actual market didn't even exist. However, we believed in it. And um, although gaming is actually still a major part of the, uh, the difference, another thing that we now firmly believe in is deep learning. Um, and it is an interesting place because the, the market isn't truly realised yet. The, the US does have a major PR train pushing it. You've got um, Google and Facebook and MSR and all the, all the different feed-in universities, etc. But here in Europe, London, um, the, um, the big picture shows that um, it, it's still only just trickling in. And um, I'm actually going to, um, to quite a few conferences where traditional machine learning is actually still king. So where we are right now is, is right here, and it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I recently watched the original AI, so... 
Um, this is Oxford's own Francis um, O'Connor. I've actually been watching Humans as well. I don't know if anybody saw that. Real coup to get to William Hurt in on that. But um, this is where we are. It's, um, it, it's actually rather uncomfortable. We're, we're getting machines to, to learn incredible things, but without the true understanding of, um, of what it means to be human. Um, Francis's character here, obviously, I, there's possibly some people in the audience that haven't seen there, is currently teaching their uh, sentient robot child to play hide and seek. Um, sentience is knowing not to go into the toilet when there's someone in there. Um, current robotics are far from, from that level. We're, we're way, way behind at the moment. We're, but we're also at this uncomfortable level where, um, and it, it is getting better, CV, computer vision folks um, are having to get used to the ideas that um, 20 years and decades of their work were actually just stepping stones on this, um, on this road. Um, I, um, I don't believe in deep learning being a bubble at all. I, I do believe on this evolving journey to, uh, to AGI and beyond. Um, Jan Le Kuhn, um can also tell many, many stories about this um, uncomfortableness that, um, that exists. But I think from uh, CVPR 15 this year that um, there's, a, there's a whole lot more acceptance into this. And, uh, and besides, uh, I think if, um, if anybody's watching Google, uh, Google's... Um, and, and sorry, DARPA's robotics challenge this year. You really only just need to shut the door, and I think your, uh, your scary robots taking over the world thing is uh, you'll realise is going to end. So I'm not going to stand here and, um, and tell you what deep learning is. I think a lot of people already do, and uh, certainly a lot of people are, are more capable of telling the maths part. Um, and it is purely maths. Um, there's not much magic in it either. Um, it's um, it does map to the first three or four layers in our own visual cortex, but um, again, you could uh, make a lot of different abstractions here. If you're talking about the eyes, etc., we um, we have 450 mega, no, maybe 480 megapixels of, uh, of resolution in our eyes. But um, you've also got varying different methods that we're learning from the biological things, like attention mechanisms, etc., where you know I can sort of pinpoint on on one particular thing in this room, even though I peripherally I can see a lot more focus is um, is is quite a lot of things and I probably need to focus on time right now actually um, the the main difference though between um, silicon and ourselves um, even though they do both age um, is that as we age we we're also able to adapt and um, the one interesting point that I can talk about wearing this particular shirt is that as far as I know we haven't yet developed um, a self-replicating, self-repairing silicon chip. So maybe, uh, maybe I need to uh, get some work done on that. Um, I think we're all fairly aware of why it's happening now as well. Um, obviously, NVIDIA GPUs, um, we've got the compute power to do this, but we've also got the data to actually drive this home. And it's been around for a while. Um, Backprop <coughs> is, uh, is the main player. And it was uh, Leibniz um, 330, 40 years ago that he was talking about the chain rule. And that's basic, um, basically the algorithms. So um, convolutional neural networks, learning multiple levels of representation via hidden layers of increasing complexity or abstraction. I'm actually quoting MetaMind's CEO, Richard Sockett, in, 20, in 2014. He's actually in his early 30s. Um, and most of the people bringing us these amazing um, advances in innovation are youngsters. And I would say that it's, it's the education that they're getting and, and also the push to be able to think outside the box. Uh, the, the reason I enjoy being at NVIDIA so much is because we have so much creativity. And I think that's really key to the advances that we're, that we're making and having those kind of um, supportive networks to actually bring home. And, and all the luminaries will... Um, will attest to this. They, they've all struggled with the um, trying to get their PhDs um, papers published, etc., and, and people not understanding fully, the actual reviewers themselves not understanding fully, but that they, they continue to, uh, to get them to move on so that we get this, this amazing un unreasonable effectiveness that, um, that we're all now well, very well aware of. Um, I also stubbornly ignored my, my supervisor and, um, and studied specifically for GPU technology, deep learning. Um, it wasn't even covered in, in my main course. 
Um, and I was working on, um, on mitosis detection. I wanted to, to prove the, the concept that you can have machines pick out these minute details. Luckily, I didn't have to do that much work for it because it had already been done. 2013, IDSIA and uh, Schmidt-Huber's lab um, were already <coughs> winning competitions doing this. That was 2013. Unfortunately, um, they were quite a few years too late for me because in 2009, my mother was killed. Um, she actually died because we currently treat cancer with just ancient, ancient protocols. Um, chemotherapy at the moment is pretty much like using a lawnmower to pick a daisy, and people are getting mown down all over the place. Um, she actually had a thumbnail-sized tumour, and the first session of chemo recommended by her consultant killed her outright three days later. Um, compared to many, that was probably a blessing in disguise because uh, my friend's mother was also upstairs um, having another session and she managed to battle on for about six years. Um, the, the point here is that um, currently our consultants don't know. They're, they're not practising and they're not capable of practising personalised healthcare. Um, if we had the results readily available for, for cross-referencing of genetic data of... Um, you know, how people are individually, um, it would be a whole different ball game. Um, and there are certain drugs out there that currently we're now able to look at a lot more closer and, and design drugs a lot more closer because of, of deep learning to be able to pick out the fact that chemo does tend to cause heart attacks in a lot of people and therefore we can give anti-arrhythmia drugs. Everyone's different. We actually need personalised healthcare. Uh, medicine, oncology drug development, genetics, they're all being assisted by deep learning. My mother's consultant couldn't possibly have known, you know, there's definitely no sort of blame there. However, Watson and, and that kind of capability that we have created would have known these things. Um, Mikai, um, 2015, I'm actually going to be there, that's in uh, just a couple of weeks. Um, Schmidt Huber, as I said, they've already proved this, um, this concept. But... Um, Again, it's important here, especially in medical, to, um, to stress the actual intention of deep learning, and that is to assist humanity. We're not there to take the jobs. We're there to, to make life a bit easier because, um, you know, we kind of need a bit of a help. This is um, quite a difficult picture. Most of the poor souls in this photo are no longer with us, but one of them is. The guy in the cap is responsible for, uh, for that morning. The reason we have a circle around him and around the package that killed all those people in Boston that morning is due to deep learning artificial intelligence. Um, we now have the power to pick out the fine detail. Fine details such as fiducial markers um, corresponding to the centres of our eyes so we can have face alignment and then ultimately facial recognition. Um, the Boston Marathon was actually a horrific lesson, but it, it was also a preempt. Um, I don't know if you saw New York Times' latest um, article on, uh, on Kim. Um, Kim is no longer with us. However, her brain is currently in cryogenics. She's hoping that, um, that we can actually catch up and, um, and, and bring her back. But Winfried Denk, who is director of the, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Neurobiology, reckons it'll be about 40 years before Josh, who's um, lying there with her and still with us, can actually basically upload or download Kim onto some kind of telepresence machine, the kind of way that we actually make a phone call. So 2009, Google Voice, Gaussian mixture models, state of the art for 30 years. 2012, it was deep neural networks, revolutionising the field with um, discriminative training. Then you have RNNs and LSTM RNNs. Um, they're obviously... I'm not going to go into the details. You're all a lot more clued up on this than, uh, than I am. But um, what happens is that we, we invent something, we're very capable of doing this, and then we'll find a problem with it. And then we're also capable of solving that problem, as we did here. AI is pretty phenomenal. Deep learning, definitely phenomenal. But we're, uh, we're pretty good ourselves. LSTM, two decades ago, we actually came up with this. And this is one of my particular favourites, and it's helping us to actually evolve and, uh, and progress very well. Um, this, this particular image I like as well, because it also brings in the, um, 
the visualisation side of, um, of what we're capable of. And um, this is um, Dr Jamie Miro, um, and he's in Sydney in their new data arena. So we're now able to, to walk in. This is actually just an image of a pipe. But you can imagine if we can then put in the human anatomy and doctors can walk in and literally sort of rotate and, and transpose the actual data while you're able to compute the entire geometry as well. Um, we're, we're pretty amazing people. Again, GPUs, a bit of a seller again. Sorry for that. But um, it, it is now trivial and, and it is just maths. Bat prop, calculus, simple as. Massively parallel mathematical operations. Um, and we're just simply able to, um, to cope with, with deep learning. Um, there's lots of work being done on the actual parallelization, lots of work being done on overlapping um, communication, and um, a lot of you in the audience are actually working on these things. Um, so food for thought that if we actually took 650 million of our, say, one teraflop GPUs, that gives us 650 exaflops. So if we took pretty much all that, that uh, NVIDIA could throw at us in the uh, GPU computing field and networked it all together, we'd get to about 65% of, of what we're capable in, uh, in our own brain. Um, and that's brute force. However, brute force is not machine intelligence. So at some point, we have to start changing. Um, and sometimes it just takes little guys like Matthew um, in... Um, Imperial College just doing a, a master's and he's he's pretty much chucked the whole deep blue thing out of the window Gary Kasparov sort of sighing with relief a little bit now because what he's done is he's stopped doing the, the brute force um, And he's actually teaching or he's he's enabling a machine to learn the tricky maneuvers that you really should be doing with with chess um, and it's an ability currently elusive that was elusive to, um, to chess engines for a long time. So gone are the days of um, brute force, I think. We'll, we'll still be doing a lot of it, but we're also starting to, to really go outside of the box. So what about, um, the, I say the other half, and it, but it, it, it's not. You know, there's this extreme inequality in, um, in, in life, the, uh, the other 90%, should we say. Supercomputers, robots, voice-enabled mobile devices. Um, they're all incredibly cool, but what if you can't even get, you know, water? What, what, if, what if you're sick and you don't have the strength to, uh, to go and find these things out? Deep learning is also helping in this. Th this isn't just an image. It isn't just a movie. Um, a Good Lie was, uh, was just out. Um, that, that is quite a good movie, actually. If you haven't seen it, go and, go and see that. But it's daily all over the world, and it's poverty. And um, deep learning can actually help and connect more people and more tech to, to, really, to really make a big deal. And um, I won't bother you too much that and the fact that Matt's also given me the two-minute thing. So um, I, I can harp on about that for quite a lot. Um, but what I did do as well is I, I studied a bit of bio-inspired. And, and I actually love this point because, um, and, and we do have talks um, about swarm intelligence later, which I'm looking forward to. I, I see the cores in the GPUs as the ants, but you also do need that queen, the CPU, to actually control things. Um, and, you know, the, these are ants that can lift weight 100 times their own body weight. Collaboration, however, is, is just totally key. I'm going to skip. A few slides. I was going to say for this, this is basically using that collaborative effect. We're now learning how to avoid things like bullies. We're also learning how to, how to cope with this incredible technology that we've got. And I think one of the really important points that the reason we have Future of Life Institute, etc., is to decide on who's going to actually roll the dice, who's going to decide how to code morals. And um, I do agree with um, Sam Harris here. Uh, neuroscientist and better speaker than I am, definitely. But he, he says that there's only one thing more dangerous, more scarier than AGI itself, and that's not understanding it. Not using it for good. Um, and what we're also capable is, is, is literally sort of crowdsourcing um, both ourselves and this technology to do great things. NOAA, the uh, National Oceanic and, and um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, have also now enlisted Kaggle. Kaggle's been uh, making a lot of 
noise lately. So they're helping the North Atlantic right whales. They're taking the aerial photography. And um, it's, going to, it's going to help the whales a lot. It's going to help us a lot. It's going to help the uh, marine biologists a lot. And um, rather than witter on for much longer, what I'm going to do now um, is I have the absolute pleasure of introducing two gentlemen who know a lot more about Kaggle than I do. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Sander Dielerman um, from DeepMind and then Jeffrey straight after Sander and hopefully we can, uh, we can keep to time. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'll try to keep this short, I only have five minutes. So I'm going to talk about uh, classifying plankton with deep neural networks. I'll explain in a minute why this problem is interesting. Uh, this is a problem I worked on in the context of a Kaggle competition. For those who are unaware, Kaggle is this online platform uh, that hosts data science competitions. And I worked on this problem as part of a team of seven people, here they are. We were all um, master students, uh, PhD students, and postdocs at uh, the Reservoir Lab at Ghent University in Belgium. And we decided to work on this competition as kind of an exercise in applied deep learning to kind of learn the ropes. Uh, and it worked out pretty well for us because we ended up finishing first out of more than 1,000 teams that participated. Our models turned out to generate the best uh, plankton classifications. So why do you want to classify plankton? Well, it turns out that if you look at a certain area in the ocean somewhere, and you look at uh, which, which species of plankton are present there, and you count them, that is actually giving you a lot of information about the health of the ecosystem in that area of the ocean. Uh, it tells you stuff about changes in temperature, which could be related to global warming. Uh, it tells you stuff about pollution, things like that. The way that's currently done is basically a bunch of marine biologists get on a boat, and they drag a, a special camera through the water, and this takes a lot of pictures. And then they just visually inspect all these pictures and they pick out the different species that they see. So this is a, a lot of manual labor and it's a problem that is very amenable to automation with these uh, deep learning computer vision uh, tactics. Uh, so in practice for the competition, what the problem looked like for us is we got this batch of uh, grayscale images of plankton, 121 different species. We got about 30,000 for training, so with with the actual species labels, and then another 100,000 that we had to generate predictions for. And we tackled this problem with deep learning, with convolutional neural networks, with an architecture based on the Oxford Net, which is a network that did very well in the ImageNet competition uh, last year. Um, so this is one example of an architecture that worked pretty well for this problem. And then there's one little uh, architectural trick that we came up with for this competition that I briefly want to mention. It's cyclic pooling. So you take an image of plankton or whatever, you compute different rotations of it, and then you pass it through the same network. And then you can uh, average the resulting representations that the network has learned and actually generate better predictions that way. And you can take this a step further, because once you're doing this, you could also think about sharing features between the different instantiations of the network. And this parameter sharing is actually a good regularizer, so it, it prevents overfitting. And that's good, because 33,000 training examples is actually quite a small data set for deep learning. So that's about all I have time for. If you're interested in this, uh, I have this uh, blog post with all the technical details. Uh, our code is available online as well uh, on GitHub. And feel free to follow me on Twitter as well. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Defoe. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, detecting diabetic retinopathy in eye images. So um, I'll start by showing some uh, images to get a rough sense of the problem. Um, so this is a fundus image, which is uh, an image of the back of the eye of uh, patient number 10. It's his left eye. And the label denotes the severity of the diabetic retinopathy condition. And this is an integer which ranges from 0 to 4. So in this case, this is 0, meaning this is a normal baseline eye. So then we have his right eye, which is also labeled 0. Um, then patient number 15 has label 1, meaning mild NPDR. NPDR is a non-proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. Um, so I'm not going to go specifically in what is sort of uh, explaining the label, but I'll make a general remark after these images. So his right eye has another label, which is label number 2, is uh, moderate NPDR. And then finally, patient number 16 um, has the worst condition, which is uh, PDR, proliferative 
uh, diabetic neuropathy. And um, so, yeah, this is the worst label. And then finally, his right eye is in the same condition. So, diabetic retinopathy is when uh, damage occurs to the retina due to uh, diabetes. Um, I'm showing you an annotated example of uh, an eye to sort of give you an idea of what we're looking for when we're um, grading these images. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, it's just to give you an idea. So, why is this so important? Well, first of all, um, there's millions of people who are affected by this. We have about 30 million people in the US and uh, 350 to 400 million people worldwide who have diabetes. And uh, in the US, about uh, 40 to 45% of people with diabetes um, have some stage of uh, diabetic retinopathy. And then of course, uh, the longer someone has diabetes, uh, this percentage grows. Um, and of course, it uh, potentially leads to blindness and loss of vision. Um, to the point that it's the leading cause of uh, blindness in the working age population of the developed world. Um, and of course, also very important, it's preventable when, you keep, uh, when it's caught and treated early. So maybe you want to do automated detection. Well, uh, up until now, we sort of, in the literature, it's quite a manual process. We have sort of um, manual feature detectors for the annotation I showed you in one of the previous slides. And um, it's also working with quite small data sets. So, but then in uh, February of this year, uh, a competition was launched on Kaggle, uh, which was sponsored by the California Healthcare Foundation and IPAX, uh, a $100,000 competition, which was open for everyone, and the models would be open sourced after the competition. Um, so yes, so these, this was the data which was provided as part of the competition. We had 35,000 labeled images and these were paired per, uh, per patient. And um, so some of the images I showed at the start of the presentation were also sampled from this uh, distribution. And we're supposed to predict it for uh, 54,000 uh, images. So which were some, which, which were some of the challenges? Um, this is the label distribution of the data set. So you can see that sort of the outer labels only account for a very small percentage of the total data set, which uh, does not give you a lot of images. Another one is camera artifacts, which are visible when you look at uh, both images of the eye, um, and they can sort of resemble some of the previous annotations I showed you, which is why it's so important to detect them. And then another example is just we have noisy images. We can have completely blank images, uh, totally different lighting condition, and so on. So this was the architecture I used in the competition. We have, um, so we have both eyes, and we let them go to a convolutional architecture uh, in parallel. And at the end, we merge the features, and we uh, input them to uh, fully convolutional uh, layers and output prediction for both eyes. Um, and I wrote a more, much more in-depth blog post about it. So if you're interested, feel free to check it out. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>